Interesting excerpts from Assault on Eternity, Richard E. Byrd, and the Exploration of Antarctica, 1946-1947, by Leslie A. Rose. Page 180 On 12 February 1947, the Kuratuk was off the Princess Rangheild coast of Queen Maud Land a PBM piloted by Lieutenants W. R. Kreitzer and F. L. Reinbolt, took off on what was presumed to be a routine photographic mission to map about 300 miles of coastline. As the flyers reached the coast, they found themselves over a hitherto unobserved ice shelf, one of the most extensive found up to that time in Antarctica. What had previously been sketched in as coast was now found to be towering shelf ice rising in blue wall tiers above the sea. Then Kreitzer and Reinbolt turned farther south, and suddenly they saw ahead of them a range of ice crystal mountains, luminously blue against the darker blue background of the sky. The odd pilots flew closer and found that the mountains rose more than two miles into the clear air. Kreitzer jubilantly radioed the Kuratuk, Surrounded by high mountains, having wonderful time, wish you were here. Cavu. Flying near the crest of the 12,000-foot range, the PBM followed the range for nearly a 100 miles without finding a corridor. They had to break off and return home, but they carried their astounding vision back with them. It was like a landscape on another planet, one of them told Bird. Excerpts from page 198. As the tractors crunched along, everyone was alert for the numerous crevices. Visibility and navigation were hazardous from the first. The sky remained overcast and often snowy, and men found themselves moving through a kind of shadowless, slow environment in which it was impossible to detect the parallel ridges in the snow which indicate crevices. Moreover, the magnetic compass on the command vehicle did not function properly, and the perpetual overcast rendered the astral compass useless for most of the time. Mr. Vernon Boyd and his men were forced to navigate by dead reckoning while constantly scanning the terrain ahead for crevices. Only once during the entire trip did one of the vehicles inadvertently stumble into a chasm. While driving along near the Rockefeller Mountains, a snow bridge suddenly gave away, revealing the depths below. As the men drove along under mournful skies, the sun was visible for only three hours during the first six days of the seven-day trek. They found themselves staring at a continuous panorama of mirages. During an entire day, huge walls of cream and dark blue-colored icebergs seemed to loom ahead, merging often into a solid blue barrier against the monotonous gray and white of heavens and earth. 208 and 209 Robert Weir and Bird saw clouds to the right and in front, so instead of continuing on southward across the plateau, Weir banked the R4D to the eastward, and Bird saw high mountains ahead as far as the eye could reach. There were clouds here and there, but our range of visibility was considerable. Some of the mountains were very high, says Bird. Bird speculated that the Queen Maud Mountains, that impressive barrier to the polar plateau that stretched across the foot of the Ross Ice Shelf, continued on indefinitely to the eastward, and did not dwindle down until they disappeared under the snow. Bird was quite correct, of course. At that moment, he was looking ahead from alongside the Horlick Mountains out toward the Thiel, and perhaps even the Pensacola Mountains, the latter some 200 miles ahead in the amazing visibility one gets down there when there is no dust. The Admiral suspected that some mountains I dimly saw to the southeastward might be a great new range, further suggesting that Bird was able to gaze hundreds of miles beyond from his vantage point thousands of feet above the rim of the polar plateau. Bird became both intrigued and frustrated. The terrain beneath was fairly flat and featureless, but as the plane continued eastward, great block-shaped mountains that were quite isolated came into view. Some seemed very high, but they were cloud-shrouded, and so any realistic estimate of their height was impossible. Again, the Admiral had the impression that this range might continue for hundreds of miles. But what of the terrain directly beneath the plane? What was it? 
shelf ice over water, or sheet ice over low land. If the area under us was shelf ice, it would not be impossible for it to continue until it connected with the Weddell Sea, which would mean there are two continents at the bottom of the world instead of one. Page 213. The crews planned to explore the coastal region around Mount Sipple, as well as the region inland, as far as the once distantly sighted and tentatively mapped Executive Committee range. The planes headed toward the latter spot first, and upon reaching the area, the men looked north to discover heavy cloud cover blotting out Mount Sipple and stretching barrier-like to the east as well. But the flight was a success nonetheless, for the area around the Executive Committee range was quite clear, and pilot crew and observers saw the magnificent range close up dominated by Mount Sidley, over 13,000 feet high. It was observed that the range seemed to tend more south-southeast than had previously been sketched, so the hazy earlier maps were corrected. Paul Sippel claimed that even higher peaks rose to the south of the Executive Committee range, and that one could be as high as 20,000 feet. Then it goes on to say, quite kind of suspiciously, that this Paul Sippel had been fooled by an optical illusion. Page 219. If there was so little to see and only the most routine ceremonies to perform, then why had Bird come? The answer lay hidden in the center of his message to Nimitz. On the other side of the pole, we are looking into that vast unknown area we have struggled so hard to reach. It was not the pole itself that intrigued the Admiral now, but what possibly lay beyond it in that region marked on maps as the area of inaccessibility. What su stupendous mountain formations might be found? What geographic configurations might await discovery, such as the oasis already viewed by Bunger and his men? What questions could be answered? What new queries might be raised? The romantic old explorer longed to find out. Bo so both planes then continued on beyond the pole. But tragically for Bird, they cannot continue on for long. The technological limitations of 1947 continue to impose stringent constraints upon venturesome polar exploration. Both men and machines were reaching their limit of endurance as the two R4Ds flew into the unknown terrain. The planes went on about 100 miles beyond the pole, angled approximately 90 degrees eastward for roughly the same distance, then turned back toward the Beardmore Glacier and Little America. So uh, it seems like at the end of the Operation High Jump uh, expedition, um, perhaps Bird had not found or reached the uh, the ice, the huge ice wall or the dome yet. But it's possible he might have viewed it from in one of his flights. But it's most likely that he reached it. And the government was made aware of it on his next expedition, which would have been the Operation Deep Freeze expedition that uh, he uh, left the U.S. and arrived in Antarctica in 1955. He was there for about a year. And um, I don't think much has been written, at least from his standpoint, about that expedition. And that is could have been the catalyst of uh, the government finding out uh, about the dome that encloses our Earth and those later high atmospheric nuclear or atomic um, discharges that were made in the high atmosphere to possibly test the strength of the dome. I'm, I'm guessing... Anyhow, Admiral Byrd died early 1957, just a year after he came back from Operation Deep Freeze. And uh, he was 68 years old, so it's reasonable to assume he died of health causes. But uh, who knows what secrets he took with him. His uh, son, or one of his sons, I don't know how many children he had, but one of his sons was found uh, later on in life in a, in a warehouse, I believe. He, he uh, died mysteriously. So this kind of uh, 
there's a level of weirdness going on there. Anyway, thanks for listening to my first Flat Earth video. Or uh, conspiracy video, whatever you want to call it. Bye.